Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for Tea with the Supremes. Last week, we actually, our last two podcasts, we were talking about the Derek Chauvin trial and some social justice issues. And we're going to switch gears this week and talk about some generational things and boundaries. So this is Julie. We're back with our all of our Supremes. So ladies, say hi. Hello. Hey, y'all. Unicorn. Hola, hola. All right. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about um, just uh, some generational differences and how to create healthy boundaries. So Cassandra, if you want to get us started. Yeah. um, So coming from the generation of, how do I say this? without sounding like a spoiled brat, um, where nobody taught me how to say no, because I never heard no in my life. I, growing up, I, and even now, I have a very difficult time setting personal boundaries for myself. Um, So just a little recap about what exactly our boundaries and what can they look like. Um, So boundaries are guidelines, rules, or limits that a person creates to identify for themselves what are reasonable, safe, and permissible ways for other people to behave around them and how they will respond when somebody steps outside of those limits. I think coming from the weird millennial Gen Z part of this generation, um, I... Yeah, I have not been good at setting personal boundaries. And that's something I've learned being in the professional world is how to communicate when, no, I can't do something, Um, especially in my position that I'm in now. um, I've set a lot of reasonable boundaries for myself so that I'm protecting my mental health and my heart and I'm not overstretching myself because being a grad student and working full-time isn't enough for me. Um, so what do you guys yeah, think about that? If I could just boundaries? interrupt a minute. Mm-hmm. So like when you um, decided you were going to implement these boundaries, how did you go about doing it? And how did you actually discern that this was a limitation for you? Was it when you started grad school or was this a, an epiphany before? Or when did you know? I think for me it actually started, I was better to, I'm better at communicating my boundaries now that I have, Mitra's holding a bullhorn right now, Little Miss Unicorn, and it's making all of us laugh. (laughs) Um, I didn't realize you could. Oh, you're fine. It's it's so on brand for you. I'm not even mad. (laughs) See, that's Um, my rock for juice. (laughs) I think boundaries I'm just saying (laughs) exactly that's the way you set your boundaries is with your bullhorn (laughs) that is true but I think that in this time of me being a counseling student and learning how to communicate with others better I have better been able to communicate to other people myself Um, I have learned to not be afraid to voice my opinion I've learned how to not just be that wallflower when somebody says something that I don't necessarily agree with. Not that I'm going and starting arguments with people, like unnecessary arguments, but if I see something out of line or somebody says something to me that provokes anxiety in me, I ask them, hey, can you not say that? Or let's talk about this. You know, have an honest conversation. Let me ask you, because it sounds like you attribute a a lot of your inability or hesitancy to say no to being a millennial. Mm -hmm. Where I think that that might more be personality traits. I don't know. I feel like as I grew up, right, I had more authority over my own voice. Mm-hmm. So as some of my older unicorns, how, or older unicorns, my older Supremes, <laughs> how, how do you ladies feel? Do you think it's attributable to what generation you were born in or more of just personality? Hmm. 
<clears throat> as the <clears throat> eldest uh, supreme, um, I want to, for our audience, our listening audience, we just had a conversation, not maybe just last week, if it was that far back um, off air. And we were talking about the power of your voice. So what Cass, what I'm hearing, Cass, is that it was your ability to find your voice and define what that was for you. As for me, um, as someone who has a kid that's not that much younger than you, um, I always called it the generation of entitlement. Mm -hmm. As if you were entitled to something, you are entitled because I have it as your parent. What I have as your parent, I choose. Good parenting says I take care of my child and that's what I'm supposed to do. But the additionals and the added things, um, that was a choice and raising being a single parent raising an opposite sex child there were and I guess that gives into gender roles or whatever but there were some key things I wanted him to have I did not want him to not be able to take care of himself um so he cooked he cleaned um he did his laundry and He did not just get money just to get money. You know, we didn't, I I didn't ascribe to the pay for grades and, and other people do it. And that's your choice. Mm -hmm. It's it's, Mm -hmm. you, the way you raise your child is up to you. But for me, those things created entitled kids because um, outside of being a parent, I got to see your entitled kids when you know the little angels that you send to school you know the children that do no wrong and they're just Mm -hmm. wonderful little angels I got to meet the other side of those angels in my classroom and in my previous life I got to see the consequences of you not putting boundaries on your children that's how they wound up there I think that's a good point too that you bring up about the classroom and seeing it in the classroom, because I think it's equally as problematic from the parental side, not just Mm -hmm. in the fact that they don't say no at home, but the, the mentality has really shifted in that the parents have way more authority in school than they should. So if a, if a child does something or is not performing in school, the teacher somehow gets penalized if the parent complains, right? Whether or not it's your, you haven't raised your child to pay attention or put in the effort or any of those things, somehow it circles back to the teacher's responsibility to address all of the problems that are rooted from the way that he's, the child is being raised, he or she. And for me, all of that goes, everything you said, I find truth in that. And it goes back to everything Cash just said because in that example so your kid gets in trouble in school now it could be that there is some kind of breakdown between the educator and your child i'm not saying educators are 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 faultless we're human however as the parent if it is your immediate response that your little angel did no wrong what message then do you send to your child that if you do something incorrect and you are reprimanded, that I come, I do not listen, I do not hear, I do not allow it to be explained fully, I immediately jump to your defense, even if you're incorrect. You are sending the message to that child that your actions have no consequences. And whatever you do, um, yeah, it doesn't matter because I, I, I am right. What is that saying? The customer is always right. No, 
Mm-hmm. You're, not, you're not. As someone in in uh, customer service and tech support for a long time, that is a horrible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> horrible mm-hmm. concept. But Cass, let me ask you that. Since you, so you grew up in a generation where you were quote unquote entitled and you were, you know, you didn't have to learn no. The way I see you now, you're very driven academically and you're very focused in school. Do you think that that impacted you anyway in school as you were younger? Um, so I'm not gonna lie, up until I was a freshman in college, I was a terrible student. Looking at me now, you probably wouldn't think that, um, but I let everything else in my life consume me other than school everything else was more important in my life than school Um, when I was 15 my parents got a divorce so I was very distracted by that and I I never learned self-care techniques from my mom or my dad you know everything was kind of always behind closed doors Um, I grew up and God bless my parents, they are better off friends than they are married. You know, they did it. In retrospect, I see why they did it. And I'm grateful that they did it because they have a better relationship now, not only for me and my sister, but for my little brother who still lives at home. He's 13 years old. So um, they did it for us. But my mom's way of setting her boundaries was screaming and fighting and kicking till she got what she wanted with my dad and that didn't get her anywhere with my father um so So I have a question since you bring that up mm -hmm. does any do you feel as though any of that maybe stunted your voice if you will or maybe hindered you in so far as feeling like you didn't have a voice yes oh absolutely um I always prioritize and I still catch myself doing this um, everybody else's feelings prior to my own. Mm-hmm. So is it more of a personality thing than a uh, generational thing in your perspective for, after discussing it? I think it's a combination of both. I really do. Um, I think that probably a majority of it is my personality Um, and kind of just ingrained in who I am but on the other hand I it could be a generational thing that entitlement generation that Ebony was talking about I do now that I think about it I do see also where the generational stuff can can factor in um more of like the instant gratification Mm -hmm. and and So let me give you an example today. We were driving and my five-year-old, we were talking about a video that we had seen and my five-year-old said, show it to me. And I said, we're not watching it right now. He's like, just search it up. And that's when I realized that like kids for the most part will never have the experience where they missed something. You know what I mean? Like it happened, it's over. You're never going to see it. It already happens because they can just search it up, which is something like, that's just a different there's no concern, there's no urgency because they have so much access, which contributes to the entitlement. You have so much access to everything. Even if your parent says no about something, you can't see this, you can't do this, whatever. They have the access to do or see it themselves. Yeah, they do. I told my son that no, he couldn't watch a movie. This little boy went on some website or something And then he saw it, but never said anything. So later on, I'm like, oh, guys, you want to watch X, Y, and Z together? He's like, no, I've already seen it. Mm -hmm. Like, what? What do you even mean? Like, and it was a whole thing. And and apparently he uh, gathered his sisters also. So they had a big family thing. I left (laughs) me out of it. (laughs) It omitted you from it. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a big big part of it is just the sheer access. So yeah. I am technically Gen X, Xennial, like I'm on the cusp of when the internet started and access, but I still very well remember school, 
Like if you wanted to know something, you had to go to the library or go to the encyclopedia, that era, which is a concept that kids, even millennials, a lot of them don't understand, can't fathom. Yeah. And it's like, and I've, ch- I've changed, honestly, with Google, I'm obsessed and I Google everything because I have like, I want to know everything and it's so instant gratification. So I see how it's creating an issue. First of all, I'm going to feel very old saying this and I normally don't feel old, but we like had to learn the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> we took I the learned that in elementary school. I knew that. Yes. Like, yeah. Okay, so I want to go backwards. Cassandra probably doesn't even know what that is. I had to learn the Dewey Decimal <laughs> System before y'all discredit me. I had to learn that too. Listen, oh, I can't tell was you learning it as like history. Days <laughs> was putting those doggone index cards back where they were. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Cass, you said something. Um, as you were ascribing some of these traits to you um you know you used your mom as the example of how she interacted with your dad um and the question was is it personality or um is it the generation so we've had the conversation and I'm sure it will continue to be a conversation of nature versus nurture so Mm -hmm. do you think that the your environment your parents do you think that altered your personality and characteristics or do you think your personality is just what it was and you're just evolving at this point so I know genetically I am predisposition to anxiety and depression, regardless of the situation, or boundaries or no boundaries. I was genetically predisposition to have this anxiety in my life. Um, both my parents have anxiety, both my maternal and paternal grandparents um, struggled, but mental health wasn't a big topic when they were alive. So they never really had an exact name or an official diagnosis for it. Um, I think that my genes were expressed more because I always, um, I always internalized my parents' arguments, um, and I kind of like what Unicorn said, I, it's almost like I internalized that, which shut my voice down. So I have a question for you because you said you internalized your parents and you had, not only are you a millennial, but you had difficulty saying no. And I'm curious because I happen to know you grew up Catholic. Do you think that that factored into your lack of voice and your lack of ability or, or your hesitancy to saying no? Oh, 100%. Um, Catholic guilt. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure you guys have heard I'm, the term. Before. I'm personally familiar with that as well. That's why I asked. Um, always had the fear of not only my parents instilled in me, but also the fear of God instilled into me. And I think that at this point in my life, that's why I've pushed so far back from my religion. Not that I'm not a spiritual person and I, mm-hmm. I don't, believe in my faith I just think Catholicism for me personally um it's not necessarily my jam your jam <laughs> okay fair and enough. that boundary for myself who knows right. I might be into down the road um, I definitely yeah understand the the draw towards spirituality and not necessarily the organized religion component because um, and we can talk about religion in a future, a future session. But I know that personally, growing up in the Catholic Church, for me, you know, the boundary issue about the ability to say no wasn't really generational, but I definitely saw it 
in the dynamics in my community and the dynamics in my family where there was definitely like dominant male authority. So in that way, I grew up understanding that my voice was different than say a male voice. Yeah, I am from a traditional European home. So my, the whole mentality in my home was and not to say my mom's not a strong, independent woman, but the male would say jump, the women say how high. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that may have skewed my ability of boundary making because um, I grew up in that environment as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what what our other Supremes think about in, in your personal lives. How do you feel your boundaries have been created? Like, where do your boundaries stem from or your ability to form boundaries? Frankly put, I just got tired of everybody's shit. That is pretty much where it came from. Because Mitra is always the go-to person, but when Mitra needs, Mitra can't call on anybody but Mitra. And Mm -hmm. then it's like, they come to me, I help them, and then they treat me like shit. So then it becomes, at what point is enough enough for me to say, okay, well, sir, ma'am, whatever, I'm done with your shit. I'm going to need you to stand to the left. I will handle you accordingly, but do not call me for any assistance Mm. and just leave it at that. Um, So that's where I started implementing um, my boundaries. And at what point, if I can ask, around what age or at what time period in your life do you feel like you were really comfortable really committing to your boundaries now before it was like so for most people I can stick to my boundaries but the ones that I consider close near and dear I'm like okay well I let the boundaries go out a little further but those are also the same ones that are quick to take advantage of the boundaries that I've pushed up just a little further to see how much they can push some more. So then it, it then becomes my responsibility to um, say, Hey, you know, this is the boundary you've crossed it. Now you need to walk yourself over to the other side and be done with it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much it. Um, But I've only recently, you know, gotten comfortable Mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. I feel very similar in that, one, it took me until well into adulthood before I had the confidence to really firmly establish boundaries. But specifically with family, it's still a challenge. Um, and you're right, family t- or those really close to you tend to lean on you without regard. Yeah. And without even interpreting how, what impact it has on you, it's just the the nature of the relationship for the past 30 Mm. plus years. So that's just how they roll. So it is harder to build up those boundaries. What about you, Ebony? So this is very interesting to me. Um, For our listening audience, um, I am the daughter of a pastor but my parent that is a pastor is my mother and not my father. My very strong, independent mother was, my father was very soft-spoken and quiet, but when he spoke, you paid attention. I wasn't raised in a environment where my voice was stifled the way I've heard you guys express it. Meaning, Julie, you said, Cass, you said, uh, it was a very male dominated home. Mm -hmm. Um, My parents were very equal. Like my parents never argued in front of us. I didn't know they had arguments until after my father was deceased. I didn't know my father did anything wrong in his life until after he was deceased. And I would have fought you if you said he did anything other than being Superman. 
However, the caveat to that is I did not have a voice because children were to be seen and not heard. You didn't have, and it's, maybe it sounds contradictory, contradictory, that's the word, um, because my parents raised us to individually think for yourself and reason and have a voice in that pers- you know in that respective but the idea of you know telling them what you wanted and what you were going to do and having a voice that not way fun. oh absolutely positively unequivocally not that did not happen however my even now and if you ask my son, he would say the same thing. My mother did not take whining and begging. You could not do that. So if you wanted something, you had to come ask. And if she said no, you or you needed to be able to present a logical reason as to why you needed or wanted this item, whatever it was. And it is something I in turn did with my son um, because I cannot stand whining and begging it because it was ingrained in me. That's just what you do not do. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of my voice was shaped, um, in that environment and my father wanting me to be treated like a little princess and my mother toughening me up, had a voice, get a voice, but you could not use that voice. So I think when I understood and had the ability to use that voice, oh man, listen, I didn't have a problem setting boundaries. When did that transition happen that you, you decided, or you learned that you were able to use your voice? Um, I think for me, mine happened as a stage of rebelling after my father passed when I was 16 and it, it, it hit me differently. And I mean, I, I say that, I don't know what the proper way it is to hit you, but it hit me differently in that I was extremely close to my father. I was the epitome of a daddy's girl. So my response was be angry and blame my mother for his death. So I started to voice that, Mm -hmm. you know, and my logic was, hey, you told me to think for myself. So I'm thinking for myself. And there's not a right age. I, I preface this to say there's not a right age to lose a parent but 16 was a horrible age to lose Sorry, guys. a parent and the parent in my opinion that I was probably closer to um now as an adult people will say and family will say and you're like you're just like your mom and they call me little her and I it still like it ticked me off oh my god nothing like her are you crazy and my son is like <laughs> why is it so you just like granny like you just like granny <sighs> me I, I found that offensive so why? why did I find it offensive yeah because I thought I was different I was more evolved um <laughs> I was I was smarter. I was whatever that I could be. I was more intelligent. I was cuter. I was calmer. I was gracious. I would never go into ministry. And here I am, went into ministry before I was legally able to drive. And um, do you think that because it sounds like you just had a lot of confidence in yourself and in, in somewhat inflated 
confidence lightly. Um, do you think that stemmed from your dad raising you and treating you like a princess and, and building that up in you? Actually, no. It, it, it came from my mom. My mom would, um, my mom was a, in her prior to ministry life, my mom was a, an administrator of a, let's just say a very large organization in New York. And she wasn't just a administrator. She was the administrator. Let's just say that. So she, when she was pregnant, you could not come up to her and, you know, rub the belly and do the, oh, goo goo gaga, you know, oh, baby. And then, no one should no, be no, no. She, um, and it, these stories didn't initially come from her. They came from other family members who thought, in our day, I'll say, uh, what we say, you, you do the most. They thought my mom did the most because she knew our names. Um, she had, before we were born, she had already named everybody. So you had to come up to her belly. I mean, if you spoke to her, you had to speak to her belly as well. And you would have to say intelligent conversations as if you were talking to another individual. So as you greeted oh. her, hello, Mrs. You know, such and such, how are you? I, director such and such how are you and she would look oh hello ebony how are you there's not a person there and it's funny because i laugh now thinking about it but when i was pregnant with my son she would call and check on me i was working for an organization here and i had to deal with people a lot more than i normally would have to in that particular capacity of my job and I got upset one day and she just happened to call me while I was upset. I, somebody just really had ticked me off. She just kind of called me in the middle of a rant. And she was like, she called my entire name, which commands immediate attention. Stop what you're doing. All three of my name. And it, you know, jerk. Okay, wait, what, what, what happened? And she was like, you will stop immediately. And you will apologize to my grandchild for upsetting him. And you would have thought if you heard her talking that she was talking to, you know, as if I had a person mm -hmm. with me. I was six months pregnant. You will not upset him and you will not have him in this environment. Will you? And I couldn't get off the phone until I said, okay, I am sorry. I didn't know his name at the time, but... I look, I am sorry, child in my womb. I didn't mean to upset you. Look, mommy was tripping. My fault. I'm sorry. And I kid you not, the kid flipped over and then just laid down and, and, and I, I don't know, went to sleep for the rest of the night. I was absolutely flawed. And I really hated to tell her that part because then she would have <laughs> thought she was right. So my strength came from her, even in my rebelling after my father passed. My mother was strong. I remember when I finally saw her break down and it was the oddest thing. He was in the casket. I had not seen her break down. And when my father passed, there are, there are six of us. I have two younger siblings and they were very young, elementary school type young. They were extremely young. And she would always tell my dad, oh, get some chapstick. Your lips are so dry. And that was the thing that made her break down. They didn't, they didn't moisturize his lips like I told them to. And she literally broke and I could not understand what. But she, she held our hands and she sat and she took my rage and I raged. I raged. And she took my rage and my brother right above me is his namesake. They have the same name. They have the same birthday. They have the same temperament. And he took that, I think he took on that father role when, mm -hmm. you know, or that adult he tried to at least. And he is still probably my mom's biggest protector. And she just took it all. I probably should have went to some therapy or some counseling. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it was 
I saw her strength. I didn't realize it until later, but I saw it. So that's where it came from. It came from her. That's a good point. I think a a lot of the positive qualities in our parents and the desirable qualities, you don't necessarily see growing up, but you see them more in hindsight. I think that's probably with a lot of, with a lot of relationships, but I could definitely see where that could help strengthen you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious from your perspectives, Cass is not being a parent yet. And then to Unicorn and Julie, who are already parents, based on what Julie just said, and those influences. So what did those influences teach you, whether positive or negative? Something I've learned from my mother, actually, is that you either learn what to do from an individual or you're learning what not to do Mm -hmm. from an individual. So was it the influence of what to do or was it the influence of what not to do that has shaped where you are cast looking into the journey of parenthood and now Unicorn and Julie in the journey of parenthood? Looking at my familial relationships, um, I learned a lot of what not to do. There was a lot. Um, Very few and far in betweens did I learn any what to do's. Um, A lot of those came from external influences, such as like friends of family or families that essentially adopted me or whatever, you know. Um, that's where a lot of the what to do's came from because you know when you're in a family and you don't know any others then what you experience is your norm and it's not until you step out of that that you say oh hey well this maybe this isn't right this is not what's done Um, so a lot of that is what clicked for me whenever you know I got to my teenage years and was hanging out with a lot of my friends, families, and things like that, noticing a difference between. Um, and then I saw that, you know, hey, I'm a bit ratchet and ghetto. It's, it's time to level up. It's crazy. <laughs> I can't be ratchet all the time. Like, this is going to be a one-way trip to the jail or somebody's whole stroll. Like, that's what's going to happen. So, like, I'm like, no, nah, we can't be doing this. So. <laughs> So Wait a minute, did happened. you say the whole stroll? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I did. I did. Like, no bullshit. <laughs> That's a thing. Like, I don't know. I'm so glad you didn't make it on the whole stroll. And I'm so mm-hmm. glad <laughs> you didn't make it to jail. Uh, All right. <laughs> power and what not to do. I will say... That. Yeah, in those lessons. <clears throat> yes. So for me, so as far as learning what to do, I definitely learned, you know, the core morality and things like that for sure. My dad worked always. I grew up the majority of my life, I didn't have a close relationship with my dad because he worked all the time. I remember when I was a senior, I played sports in my entire life. And when I was a senior in high school, my dad happened to make it to one of my softball games. And I lived in a small town. So, you know, everybody knew everybody. And one of the girls on my team saw my dad and was like, is that your dad? Like, oh my God, I've never seen him. So, But from him, I learned work ethic because he worked his ass off his entire, literally, and while he was dying, he was still working as hard as he could. So that I definitely got from him in a roundabout way. Um, My mom was definitely the compassionate person. And I, I picked that from her for sure. But again, you know, kind of in that religious context and the dynamic of of our family, she was very meek and very passive. Um, 
she was very non-confrontational. So she let kind of the kids take over at a very young age. Um, So it was kind of chaotic in that way. And that I think that influence definitely made me, I'm a very strong, aggressive woman. (laughs) I think to combat kind of that, that influence, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just not what I wanted for me. And I want my kids, you know, my kids know not to challenge me. They might do it jokingly, but they don't do it seriously. And I, you know, that's part of I want them to know like daddy doesn't play. Mommy doesn't play either. Like when, when it's business is business, we're both equally the boss. It's not, you know, traditionally you hear a lot of wait till dad gets home. I wanted to circumvent that. Like, you know, dad is an authoritative figure in the house. Mom is also authoritative in the house. So that's kind of the what not to do that I learned. So is observing your mom a way that you've learned to implement boundaries with your children? And did that trickle over to, excuse me, uh, boundaries with others? So definitely the way that I interact with my kids is very different than the way my mom interacted with us. So that factored in for sure. And as far as others, I think, again, it took me a long time to realize that I had a voice, I guess, seeing such a timid example and a mild example in my home. But on the other side, you know, I, I used to think I was exactly like my mom because she's so compassionate and she's like the nicest person. And growing up, I saw my dad worked all the time. There were three of us. So my mom stayed home and she did everything for us. She cooked, she cleaned, she brought us to all our activities. Like anything that we did, we had to rely on my mom other than the financial aspect. So she carried the whole weight of that. So so that part, I definitely um, picked up on and I was a lot more mild. I guess I didn't realize for a long time that as a female, I was entitled to the same kind of authority and respect as male counterparts but I think that has a lot to do with just my upbringing and being in the church gotcha Cass do you have a way in here what do you think you'll be like I think I learned how to be compassionate and empathetic from my mom I think I learned how to be a hard worker from my dad and to hustle very hard very similar to Julie very, very similar to Julie. But as a somebody who's going to be a parent in the near future, oh, fuck, not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just breathe through a girl. Oh, no, I, I sound very like I don't want kids, but the truth is I do want kids. I just, you're never actually ready for kids. They kind of just. That's a fact. Come. Ever. Ever. Um, But I think something that I want to also teach my kids along with the work ethic and the quality between mom and dad and um, being authoritative from a front, a parental front rather than go ask your mom, go ask your dad, all that Mm -hmm. bull crap. Um, I, I think something that's important is to also teach about like body and like the body and like self-awareness and what your boundaries are in like your personal bubble Absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. being coming from an Italian and Polish family there's no physical boundaries like we're always hugging and kissing and I never learned how to say no in terms of my body or like the physicality of my body my dad Mm -hmm. still can't even say the word period when talking about like a female Mm -hmm. cycle like his dog just had her first period and he's like she's on her thing right now like (laughs) you're you're a grown man you have to say she's on her thing right now just say she's on her period so I think something and I was actually just watching this lady has this amazing TikTok where she talks about um and she sets boundaries with her kids on different topics but appropriate for their age group she posted this one where she was like 
she has two younger daughters who I, I think are like three and five, but she also has a 15 year old. And so she politely asked her two younger ones, hey guys, can you go upstairs? Me and my son are talking about a sensitive topic that you guys aren't ready to talk about. And then she had them repeat that back to her. Like, I'm not ready to talk about this right now, but it will happen in the future. And I think that's important throughout the stages of life to teach your kids what their physical boundaries are. That I completely agree with. I think there's, again, this can be another topic, but I think that there are a lot of parents who err on the side of what they don't know won't hurt them. And I think that that is a very common misconception because if you look at children who are preyed upon, it's often because they, you know, they don't even know that what's happening is not supposed to be happening because that those kind of conversations were never had because it's an uncomfortable conversation. And a lot of people say, let kids be kids, which I totally agree with. And that's another thing that's that is different, very different from the way I was raised. We didn't talk about anything ever. Like none of, we didn't talk about sex. We didn't talk about anything. You know, you learned it, however you learned it, when you learned it from somewhere outside of the home. And that's very different than I will raise my kids because I think of partially because of the exposure of the internet and access to information, but also just because I want my kids to know that if something comes up that shouldn't, that they know that it's something that shouldn't have happened. You know what I mean? What do you guys think? I think that's, uh, that sounds about right. I mean, that's what I do with my kids. Um, Give them examples, even close relatives. A lot of people, when they go over that, they don't uh, take into account that relatives can be predators just the same. So absolutely, most actually of young children are someone they know, someone close. Exactly. And that's not something that we actually address whenever covering that with them. So whenever I was doing it with my children, I would be sure to let them know, you know, hey, it's okay if you don't want to give Papa a hug. It's okay if you don't want to give mommy a hug. And, um, you know, you're, you know that you're not supposed to be touched in those particular places. And then it's like, you also know, well, where the hand should go on the back um, and where the uncomfortable area begins from, you know, adults. And also keeping in mind, and this is something that I neglected to cover with um, my oldest, but, you know, sometimes older children can also be predators just the same. And we don't look at them as being predators either. So that's also something to mention to them that, okay, yes, I did say that um, Uncle Bob, you know, could be a predator. And these are some things that could occur, not saying that Uncle Bob is, but this is an example. And then saying, oh, well, you know, Cousin Johnny, who's 15 and hanging out with 18 and 19 year olds, decides, well, hey, they did this to their girlfriend or whatever. I'm just going to go figure it out with cousin Emily. You know what I mean? Like those are some Mm -hmm. things that we also need to address. Again, (laughs) not saying that the cousin is a baby diddler, but that, you know, these are some things that can't occur. So, you know, and that's not something that I covered with my children, unfortunately, but, Mm -hmm. you know, or with the oldest one, but I have with the um, other ones and also giving them options to, um, report the discomfort, being able to express it in a safe place and not being dismissed, feeling hurt, you know? So that's another thing to consider whenever going over, you know, your personal space or your personal bubble. Personally, I'm just like, look, if we can touch, we're too close. Like, that's just it. And that's pretty much the standard that my kids use. (laughs) And uh, as you can see, Kai is a firecracker. So she's just like, (laughs) yeah, no, don't touch me. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, if you don't want to be touched, you don't want to be touched. I agree. There's so, yeah, there's so much. I think boundaries are super important. You have to just explain, you know, this, these areas are for, you and no one else, Mm -hmm. you know, and regardless of who it is, you know, anyone in your family doesn't matter. These are, you know, that's a conversation I think that most, I'm not going to say most, I don't know, but a lot of people I don't think have 
with their kids and Ebony, I saw some faces when we said mm-hmm. these things. So I'm sensing a dissenting opinion. So I'd love to hear your, your input. Um, I do not have a dissenting opinion. And let me preface this statement and say, you are entitled to raise your children whatever way you like to raise your children. If you agree or disagree, it is your choice as long as you're not causing scarring them physically. Um, I don't think, I personally don't believe any child doesn't come out scarred emotionally even with a great parental upbringing. So, and feel free to disagree. Hey, that's your opinion, I don't care. So um, I I agree with teaching your children. And I guess that is a form of setting boundaries. I agree with teaching your children what is good touch and what's bad touch in your personal areas and, and, those shouldn't be touched. I I think that's a a conversation every parent should have with their child. And you should continue to have that conversation with your child. However, some of the things I just, and it could be the age difference. It could be the cultural differences, but... I think coming from the generation of children being seen and not heard. um, And even with that, my, my parents allowed us to be individuals to an extent. Let's just say that you, you didn't have the freedom to tell your parents, no, that wasn't happening. Um, But they made sure we could express ourselves. I will say that. I'm not going to deny and say that wasn't the case. You know, when the summers, when the kids are just running around doing whatever, look, we had to go to the library and do book reports and we had to do cultural things. Um, My mother would find every summer program you could and we learn Swahili and French and we art and, 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 you know, museums. And my mother was worse than any other teacher you could ever have. Read the dictionary and explain what this means. I don't know. I don't want to do all that. However, so we had the opportunity to express ourselves. But as I hear you discuss the evolution of some of these boundaries? I don't know, I'm not sure. As the person in this group who has gotten to the other side of that level of parenting. My, my I mean, he's always going to be my baby. That's my heartbeat, but he's 20. He's not a baby. That, although sometimes I'm a little concerned, um, that level of parenting is different. So when Cass was explaining, um, I'm curious before I finish answering this question, Cass has an idea in her mind of how parenting is going to go and the things I want to do. And I remember that conversation or those conversations I would have with myself or with other people. And as I look back on them, boy, I was stupid. Let me just go ahead and tell you. So for the two of you, as you think back to who you thought you were going to be as a parent and who you are, are they the same? Um, Are they different? Is that perception, you know, the conversations when you were in Cass's spot and this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to raised my children and I thought I was going to be Claire Huxtable and (laughs) yes and yeah no I didn't turn out to be that way so I'm kind of curious I think well I didn't want to be a mom for a very long time I was like I don't want kids I don't want to deal with any of this neither did Um, I I was not now they are I'll tell you that yeah so that 
I don't know when I started thinking about having kids. As far as the mom that I wanted to be, I just knew that I wanted to be as loving as my mom, just very loving and more involved than my dad was able to be. You know, I, at the time I didn't realize that my, you know, when you're growing up and your parent is working all the time and never home, you don't realize their contribution so much as when you're older and you understand what they sacrifice. So I just knew I wanted to be involved and make sure that my kids knew they had a a resource, but I also wanted to make sure that they were respectful. You know, we, we were respectful of our parents growing up. So I wanted to just instill all the same things. I definitely um, changed through experience with my kids. We went through my oldest when he was three or four. He went through a phase where he was just very bad for a brief window of time. But he was at daycare and he was slapping teachers and all kind like, which is not any kind of environment he had ever been in that had that kind of he would have never seen it outside of daycare, I guess. We had no idea what was going on. We were honestly concerned that something was happening at daycare. Um, but we went through different phases of discipline. You know, at one point, I took everything out of his room but a mattress and a pillow. And, you know, we did, we tried spanking. Like, our that whole progression has changed very much. And I think with everything that we're talking about, and everything that we've been talking about really over all of our podcasts. I think the core of a lot of things is just effective communication. It's the same way with parenting. As my oldest son started growing up, we used to sit down and say, I'll never be mad at you. Let's have a conversation. And then we'll talk about it. And then I'll decide if I want to be mad at you, but we'll have a conversation. And that so he knew for a long time, if he did something wrong in school, before the school would call me, he would tell me about it. So it's, it, it's really just communication about a lot of things. Really? I'll never be mad at you? Really? I said, I, well, I won't be mad at you first. <laughs> but okay. I always said, let's have a conversation. You can get your side out. So before I lash out at you, okay. I will say, as much as I love that, and it worked very well. I have kind of gone away from that just because I'm exhausted and have too many kids. I'd love to get back there, but effective communication is definitely key for for everything. Okay, what about you, Unicorn? Um, I actually use something similar to what Julie was just saying. Um, Because I usually tell my kids, you know, if you lie to me, you're going to have consequences. If you tell me the truth, then we can talk about it and then we can go from there. Um, So usually they give the truth, we talk about it, we explain what what was wrong or why it was inappropriate. And then, you know, we go over why we're not going to do it again. And then, you know, we go on with our, our lives there. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I implement for sure. And then as far as the mom I thought I'd be, honestly, I don't know what kind of mom I thought I would be. I know I wanted to be different than uh, my mother. That was really my goal, but I found that I overcompensated in a lot of areas, um, which was my downfall. So, um, you know, as Julie said, as the kids started growing, as did I, so that was a thing and I've gotten better, I would say. Um, Actually, my cousin would argue and say that um, I still don't say I love you enough, but it's like Mm -hmm. at the same time, my kids know I love them and I never really heard I love you as a child so it's like it's weird you know for me to say it Mm -hmm. um but you know I do show them in other ways you know have you ever asked your kids if they like you like to hear you say it just out of curiosity no I never ask them but when I tell them they just look at me. One looks at me, gives me a weird face, and then walks <laughs> off. And the other one says, yeah, mom, I love me too. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I do. Know. So that's similar. You know, we didn't hear that a lot growing up either. And I 
I guess I wanted to more or something. I, I mean, looking back because I tell my kids excessively to the point where my son is always like, I know, I know, I know, I know. Like, <laughs> and when he's, my, so my oldest is 13. And if he goes somewhere, like he has to say, I love you back to me on the phone, which, you know, he's at the age now where it's like, <sighs> and I was like, listen, I can embarrass you this way, or I will embarrass you way worse right. if you don't want to reply. So he says it regardless, and it's fine. Um, but that, yeah, I definitely overdo that part. Yeah, like it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I asked the older one if, you know, she felt I said I love you enough, but it's like, I don't know. She just looked at me like it was a weird question. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know here, but my cousin you, is like, no. Do you don't. think they thought it was a weird question because it's not something they heard? Or do you think they just, just as a teenager, everything is weird that your parents do? Um, I'm not sure because they tell me all the time, oh, but you're so extra. So I, it's not, um, no wonder you did this or something along those lines. So it's like, it would be, it would be normal, you know, for me to say or do something abnormal. So if that were a question to be considered abnormal, then, you know, it's something they would expect, I'd assume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your comment saying you're so extra made, made me think of something. I did envision myself to be like the cutesy Pinterest mom who every holiday is like so over the top. And I don't do any of that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and I think it's more because I don't like I don't really ascribe to it. I'm not super invested in holidays. We started kind of very young with our kids where we were in a place where we could travel. So versus the holidays, we often would try to, you know, do something as a family, preferably somewhere awesome. And that's what they're accustomed to. So they're not even super my my oldest never believed in Santa. That wasn't us necessarily um although I was very anti-Santa because I think your parents work hard for what they give you so you should appreciate that absolutely um but that's just me but I definitely saw myself being like the one that's doing all that over the top decorating and all this nonsense and I don't really do any of that now see that's funny because growing up as a child I I view my life in stages when I say things. So pre my father's death, we were that family. Everything was over the top, Christmas trees, you know, eight, 12 feet tall, you know, it was a whole big thing. And then my father died, but my father died four days before Christmas. So... Christmas changed for my family. It changed significantly. However, I think God has a sense of humor because my son was born. He was like two weeks, almost two and a half weeks overdue. So he was born literally, it is seven days to the day before my father passed. And I think his birth was the beginning of the transformation. And I am now 42, so we can count these years. Uh, His birth, because he was the first grandchild in the house. My brothers had children, but that's different. You're not the daughter living in the house with the child. So Christmas began to you know, take shape and trees and very little things, nothing major. However, I was always the child that did not want to get up on Christmas morning. Like the rule was you could not open gifts until everybody was up. And all my siblings were always upset because I would be sleeping. I don't see a point to get up early to do that. So I was never that person for Christmas and even worse after my father passed. 
um, my parents would make do something as an act of service, even before they were in ministry, you know, we would pick all the gifts would be wrapped and everybody would have to pick a gift. You didn't know what it was. Um, and that would be the gift that we would give away to, um, a kid and you wouldn't know what it was. That's awesome. You still wouldn't know what it was. Um, so as much as they went all out, cause my parents spoiled us, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, the negative part of this is I think, I don't think I know I instilled in my son, um, this desire to not like when he was very little I would put the trees up and do all of that but I literally have to remember to put up a Christmas tree like I can't and it would be his birthday they're like oh it's his birthday let's get the Christmas tree or I get the Christmas tree that already went on sale like on Christmas Eve or Mm -hmm. like two days before (laughs) and let's put it up or um possibly put up a decoration or and I I think I have ruined him in that sense because once he was big enough we just wrap up the gifts and just bam here you go um and he'll tell you now he came over he lives on his own and he came over probably Christmas Eve or the day before and he put the tree up and he put the lights on the tree and then it became Christmas. Oh, he decorated the tree. Now it's Christmas. And he was like, Marty, you really want to do this? Like, do we really want to? Okay, Ma, I'll, I'll get the tree and let's, let's put it all up. You're going to be mad because you got to sweep all these pine needles up <laughs> off the floor. And Oh, you go out and do the uh, real one? I'm not invested. Um, I have like a four foot artificial one that I bought this year only because I have two little ones and we couldn't go anywhere see when we were younger pre my father's death they would not dare dare bring a fake tree my parents wouldn't have it my father wouldn't have it like they would go out I don't know where you went to get a tree in New York but you know they would go get a tree and like whatever I don't know I'm I'm in the country now so they got Christmas tree farms everywhere um but I did for a couple years, but it just felt like it was dishonest to, to do that. <clears throat> then I found one on sale and I was like, oh, we can just keep reusing this one and um, do that. And my son was like, oh, that don't look right. You know, um, but this is the same kid who was telling the little kindergartners, hey, 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 there's no Santa. What? Why are you crying? Yeah, like, yeah. We had that conversation with my my oldest because he didn't realize that not everyone thought the same as him. So we had that we had that incident as well. Like the teacher was all upset. Mommy, I got in trouble. Why did you get in trouble? Look, son, everybody doesn't believe that. Hey, hey, hey. I, didn't Jesus die for us? Okay, son, everybody doesn't believe that way. I thought you said that's the way we were supposed to believe. See, okay, listen. <laughs> Listen, listen, listen. You know there's nobody. You don't even have a chimney. Look, son, you can't tell the kid you can't do that. So, I mean, I hate that I didn't have, I didn't continue those traditions. Um, you know, on one, I think, Julie, you said it. On one hand, I overcompensated because I was such a daddy's girl and life went a different way and I wound up being a single parent which is something I never envisioned because I wasn't the little girl that dreamed of weddings and children and Mm -hmm. you know I had brothers they got on my nerves I did not want and they tormented me I didn't want that that's Mm -hmm. typical brother Mm -hmm. so I overcompensated because I thought I did my son a disservice. I didn't know that it was going to wind up that way, but I thought I did him a disservice because I had such an amazing parent. So there were things I over 
compensated for. And I, I, I regret, I'm sure he'll have a different version, but I regret not keeping those traditions and forgetting pre my father's death, what that was like for my family versus after my father's death. And then, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, for years after we finally took the Christmas tree down, we didn't put a Christmas tree up again. It was my son. It was after my son was born before a Christmas tree went up in my mother's house. And it's probably just a little four foot, you know, I think I was living back. I was living at home the first time we put an actual tree up in the, so I regret. One thing I will say though, and this is for Cass as well. Um, when you look at traditions, you know, kids have a, sm a short memory span, even adults really. So I had a similar conversation with my mom not too long ago. And she said, I'm not the grandma I thought I'd be. And I said, you know, first of all, you're, you have a ton of grandkids and they're little, um, but also, you know, just make those traditions. You know, my oldest will talk about traditions that we have that maybe we started doing like three years ago. And I'm like, you know, you can miss out on a bunch of years, just, just make it. And the, it'll be just as, just as meaningful. There's things that my kids remember that, you know, didn't come about. I skipped a bunch of years and then started doing things. So you can still pick it back up, even though your son has grown. My oh, yeah, mom, my mom, not many that you years ago. What? That tradition that you and your kids have now, that's the tradition when he got older. And I was like, listen, you're not a baby. Um, so do you want to do this or do you want to do this? Do you want to hit the cruise or do you want to? Cr yeah. no, we're cruising. Okay, let's go. So we didn't feel the need to spend holidays at home because I cooked and everybody was at my house and I don't really feel like all them people mm -hmm. so that's not what we do so you you're right you make those traditions as you know as they come and it's it actually I feel like the you know you said the cruise we actually my oldest we gave him the option right I said when we started going on vacation over Christmas we said you can have you know we're gonna go away and we can go on vacation or you can have gifts like, we're not going to do both. And he was like, all right, let's go on vacation. Because that's quality, uninterrupted family time. You know, kids really, all they want is your undivided attention. Okay. So, that's you know, not, go live it up. It. But I will <laughs> say I had the same, I had the same conversations. At the beginning, I was a single mom. And, you know, life wasn't always easy. Um and I was a bit proud, so I wouldn't ask for help. Um, and we would have conversations at the beginning of the school year or at the beginning of the year. Listen, you want this or you want one pair of Jordans or you want two pair or three pair of something else because I could spend the money on this or I could get you a couple of these. And I'm going to say his uncles, my brothers are amazing. They, they would do things for my son as if uh, no different than they do for their own boys. Um, so he was always blessed. But we would have conversations. So you want this or we could do this. We can go here or you can have, and it would be his decision to do this or to make this. So I say that because as I was shaking my head, you know, um, <clears throat> as you guys were saying, um, creating those boundaries, um, I did and I extended those boundaries and, and gave him the ability to have a voice in a sense. Um, but it, 
if I'm honest, it came from my, my mother's desire to say, hey, don't whine, don't make, have a logical something. And I'm, I'm a very logical, analytical person. So, hey, present this to me. This is what we're going to do. We're going to have option A or option B. It was just he and I. So we had conversations. What, what do you want? Which way do we go? What are we going to do? And that was a part of his process. I didn't always do that. And I didn't always have those conversations. But When did you start to implement that? It came, I, the first time it came about was he wanted, it was sneakers. It was a pair of sneakers. He wanted some sneakers. And I was like, listen, you can buy this one pair of sneakers or you can get two pair of sneakers from over here. And even now at 20, my son is a sneaker head. I, and, yep. and he earned it. He earned it honestly. That's being off, that's the New York City genetic. Right. He got it. He got it for me because it is no different than I got my sneaker game and my shoe game. Is is no is no different. And it was, I want this, this, and this, and I want them in this color, this color, and this color. Okay, listen, let's be realistic. That's not gonna happen if we get one pair of these or two pairs of these. So we might get two pair of these and we'll get one. What's your decision? And then it was like, it was for me, it was like, oh, okay, that's, that's logical. Let give him a choice in the matter, which for me was an evolution. But for my prior generation, when they heard that kind of interaction, they would hear right. him say something back to me. And it was taken as being disrespectful, but I had taught him have an opinion and say something to me. And it came out as, you know, how could you let him be that disrespectful and say something back and do that? And I'm like, you know, if we circle back generationally, I would say for, for my child, and it could be a, a, a product of where we live as well, but it did used to be that children had absolutely no authority whatsoever, right? And now at the youngest generation, which Gen Z, I would say, there is a lot more power that the children carry, which I think, I think we've toggled too far. <laughs> a yeah. lot of people have, I think there's a, a big lack of parental authority in a lot of households. Um, there is. And, I, and I think entitlement and privilege have fed a lot into that. I can say for my own children, you know, I, we, we discipline and we expect a lot from our kids but in the community that we're in the social circles of their peers are very entitled and very privileged right so it's hard you know when they're constantly surrounded by by peers like that and as I was saying you know we for Christmas we'll go on vacation so at a young age my kids have been to many countries I didn't leave the country other than Canada, I didn't leave the country until I was grown, married, just before I got married. And my kids are young and they've, you know, had lots of opportunities. We did that, you know, we gave right. them that, but it right. does build to the sense of entitlement. See, I agree uh, because I have to be honest that that affluent friend group, my son played soccer. Soccer is not an inexpensive sport and soccer is not a sport in my area where um, a very large number of African-Americans play the sport and soccer is something they start when they're walking, before they're walking, they put the ball in front of them. See, I didn't know these things. I, I didn't, that wasn't something that I knew. It wasn't the only sport he played, but that was a very foreign sport to me that entitlement. So I found that I would be harder and I, it took me a while to figure out that's what would happen because I would hear and see these very entitled, very wealthy parents catering to their children. And I would look at my son and I'd be like, I wish you would. And he, mommy, I didn't say anything. Okay. Listen, let me my, just tell you just in son. case. 
says that all the time. He's like, why do you always look at me and say, if you ever do that, like, I'm not going to try that, but it's happening. Right. Just in case you decide it. And then on the flip side, he also started traveling when he was young. So he's been to multiple countries and done other things. And he was in elementary school. And nobody knew we were going on vacation because he was going to miss school for a couple of days. And I didn't lie. There was a family member that had passed in Florida and we were going to go to the funeral, but that's because we were leaving from the port of Miami. Um, <laughs> and he told the teacher, he was like, you know what? You just mad because you had to be home for your vacation <laughs> while we were out in in the Cayman Islands. Listen, 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 you, I, oh my God, he is one of these entitled kids. And so when I would hear the flip side of other children, I would be harder on him so that he would not turn into that. And he caught the brunt of things that he shouldn't have. And his friends that were with me, they, hey, 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 you, and he would tell them, listen, my mom's is different. Don't, don't do that in front of my mom's because you, you might get snatched up. I'm just telling you, don't, don't do that. So I, I will say something I learned about boundaries in this evolution is that I've had to go back and apologize to my son. To your son. Mm -hmm. I've had to, that's something prior generations before me didn't do. You just, dealt with whatever it was. And I, I believe for the most part, parents do the best they can with what they have. Absolutely. With the logic, with the information, with the knowledge, you don't know the trauma they're working through. The generations before me, people were, incest was happening, molestation was happening, and it was kept quiet. You didn't say anything. And boy, they really look alike. That's because that uncle had messed with that child and that that baby is that like all of those things come mm -hmm. out in 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 there those hidden secrets that you didn't say anything about. So I think as we figure out those boundaries, it's an evolution of because I've I, at at twenty now I've went back and had conversations because we we didn't have you know there weren't there were times that it wasn't great you know and there are times that. I thought I was doing the right thing and I didn't. And I was hard on, this is what a child is supposed to do. And this is what an adult is supposed to do. And those things change and those boundaries evolve and you should grow. And as your, that dynamic changes. And I think that's very hard for us as parents to understand that boundary. I don't, you're experiencing, I guess you're getting to the beginning of that, Julie, be, because you're, you have stages with yours and, mm -hmm. you know, you have to let go with that teenager. But when you get to adulthood, they don't prepare you for that boundary. They don't, your life becomes revolved around these people, this little person, and then that changes. And you don't get to tell them what to do and they listen and you don't get to do that. So that dynamic, those boundaries have to change that, that voice that you found, you have to be willing to now accept it from them. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. So you mentioned the growth for sure. It's really a growth of your relationship with your children and that is the hardest thing for me, especially with my oldest. Like I said, I, we give him a lot of privilege and entitlement. He grows up with it, but we also have really high expectations in comparison to a lot of friends. And I, I toggle heavily over, he should be doing more and I'm pushing him too hard. You know, yeah. I'm being unfair. He's being unfair. So it is a constant, like battle and, and you do have to you're very right like you have to give your kids independence so that they are ready when they have you know when my my husband's like when you're 18 you're gone <laughs> 
So, which yeah. mom, mommy's not going to let that happen, but um, they have to be ready, you know, when they're ready yep. to be on their own, they have to be ready. So they have to have that innate responsibility and understanding of what they need to, to do. Uh-huh. To, to bring that full circle back to Cass and how this started, I think this evolution that we go through as parents, as individuals, if we do not find that balance of individuality and, and independence for our children, then we create those entitled adults who don't have the boundaries, who can't express themselves, who didn't realize that somebody says no. So right. when a, a boss says no, when an employer says no, and they have temper tantrums and meltdown, like had we done everything that Cass described, everything, um, had we given them those <laughs> boundaries, when do we establish that voice, you know, everything that everybody has said to make it come full circle so that you do not have the generation that what we started saying the the child who is completely disrespectful to a teacher or who can't say no or who can't determine what's good and what's I, I, I use the word good and bad loosely but what determines correct or incorrect or however we get those those dynamics I think the bottom line of all of this from what we've talked about, and this is just what I'm getting, is our parents' communication styles have a lot to do with how we communicate and how we set boundaries with ourselves and others as adults. And that's not to say that's every person's case, because I feel like a lot of people go through self-growth periods. But yeah, I think had my parents communicated with me more effectively, I probably would have been better at setting boundaries for myself. Um, personal boundaries. But at the same time, I learned on my own how to do that. And I found my voice within my growth. And I'm not mad at it. I'm really not mad at it. I really like what you said that you're not mad at it. Like I, I'm very similar. There are things that I learned by experience that I, you know, wish that that wasn't the case. However, I think of all the things that I've experienced in my life, even the worst, because of the strength that I've gotten and the the ability to overcome things based mm-hmm. on my experiences has really made me able to see the silver lining or see the lesson out of everything, even the worst things. Because at this point in my life, when I go through something, I'm able to kind of deal with it while I'm going through it saying, there's going to be something positive out of this. You know, Mm -hmm. it could be something dark, but I'm going to learn something from this. It's going to either you know, it's going to be something I can teach or help someone else, or I won't do it again based on the lesson I learned. And, and I think that comes from just experience. And I think a lot of my boundaries were developed that way. Yeah, you have that empowerment Mm -hmm. from the different situations that you've experienced. And I think that's anybody, I think everybody throughout adversity gain empowerment. Mm -hmm. At least that's the hope that everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. I think not everyone is able to recognize it is the mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. You know, and, I, and as sad as it is, I feel like those that experience more adversity become more aware kind mm-hmm. of, of, of the things that come out of it. But the theory that there is no pleasure without pain. Um, there is no happiness without sadness. We've encompassed a lot in this conversation. I am going to say, I want to clarify and say, I heard what Cash just said. I don't by any means 
blame my parents or I don't think your parents should get the blame per se for where you are or what you have or have not developed in your communication style because there is a scripture in the Bible that says, when I was a child, I thought and acted like a child. And when I became an adult, I put away childish things. There are things that you should glean and take from your childhood, good or bad, because that there is a truth that you either teach me what to do or you teach me what not to do. I learned from your example how to move forward or not. And this is this is not including the outliers. We're not talking about people who were abused and 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 violated and and those things. That's not what I call parenting. That's abuse. That's different. That's not what we're saying. So I hold me accountable for where I am. Hopefully I've learned some lessons from my parent, some good, some not so good, but I've learned the lessons and I use that to move forward because for me, laying blame on them creates that entitled generation. That's what that creates for me. So as a parent, shout out to the parents. You should learn what you learn. The other thing as a future parent though, Cass, which Um, I think all parents know, but no one knows what they're doing. It's impossible to know what you're doing. It's the same with literally any, any position, any, anything. No one actually knows. You're just getting through Mm -hmm. it the best that you know how the best of your ability. So you can't blame someone for, for doing their, absolutely their best. That's what the entitled generation does. I (laughs) hold you accountable. We've, We've all said positive and negative things that we've gotten from those influences, whether it's family, religion, generations before us, um, examples of what to do, and in some cases, examples of what not to do. But I think the purpose of this is to say, to acknowledge it and then do better, learn. I had to go back even now and apologize and I keep reevaluating my relationship with my son because we're in a different place. You know, I reevaluate my relationship with my parent because we're in a different place. You know, it's different when we're adults now and we have to look back at those things, learn the lessons and then move forward. So I am, I'm, I'm really intrigued as we had this conversation, how we, move forward in those lessons, even now, as we take it into our professional careers. And, you know, anybody who's done this, this, this counseling walk, you know, it's just years of unpacking all the stuff that you didn't know was there. So I'm Mm -hmm. I'm curious as we take this, this growth and move forward in our personal communications and our ability to set the boundaries for us that are healthy. Still, I think even now, evolving and learning what that voice looks like. Because my voice at 21 is not the same as my voice at 42. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today with Tea with the Supremes. Next week, we are going to get into this conversation a little bit further, talking about specific communication styles and what that means for relationships with professionals and at work and friend relationships, family relationships, and how we communicate and how we can communicate better. So definitely check us out next week. Bye y'all. Adios.